I really wanted to go to your Peter Church and False Prophecy yeah, uh, article, Christian. So, I mean, I, I really much enjoyed I enjoyed this because I mean, kind of a little bit of guilty pleasure, but it kind of seemed like Peter Church and I didn't actually know about him before reading this article. Maybe I'd heard of him, but didn't remember. It's kind of one of these uh, natural science quantitative scientists who thinks that with that, he can just apply it to everything and predict everything in life, kind of. I mean, I'm sure I'm a bit yeah. butchering it, but yeah. 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 So this book, End Times, is getting uh, a bit of traction. And I was actually asked to write the review because uh, I don't think I would have read the book otherwise. Um, because you kind of knew what he was going to say kind of thing? Or what, why were you hesitant? Or Because I think what? it's a bad book. I had picked it up. I saw it at the airport, and you know. Oh, okay. If that's I had sign. seen it, or not, yeah. If I no, but nothing against having books in airports. One of my books was once in an airport. Um, oh, okay. Well, except that one. No, but it was like you know, if I if I picked it up in an airport, not having already known about, it, I think I would have leaved through and like I don't. Know, that seems kind of like silly. But the reason I don't like it is because Peter Turchin started out as a theoretical biologist trying to predict. Um, population dynamics for plants and animals and you know life forms he gets tenure and he moves on to questions that are normally handled by the social sciences and his his main area of focus is sort of the the collapse of civilizations and the causes of revolution this sort of stuff and he uses unfortunately he still uses his his mathematical modeling to answer these questions. And that is problematic in a number of ways. One, because it just takes up a whole bunch of space. He's busy justifying his mathematical model. Also oh, oh because it's like limited, I mean, you have to reduce the total, you know, the, the oh. complexity of history to a variables. Yeah. yeah, the variables that you can plug in again and again for each case study and then, you know, run your regressions to figure out what's the key variable. It all strikes me as very pseudo scientific, and at best he comes up with the same kind of interpretations that people already were coming up with, but in the process telling much richer, more dynamic stories. Uh, so, but the problem is that because of scientism, because of this cult of the scientific method, this reification of the scientific method into this thing, a lot of people fall for this. They're like, oh, you know, and Peter Church is like, I'm not, these aren't like, these aren't my, uh, you know, theories. They're so right. like, yeah, facts. Yeah, this is, this is what, this is like, this is objective truth. This is what, you know, crisis DB, the crisis database has, has told us. And he's, he's helped start a, a subfield of this kind of history called cliodynamics, not to be confused with cliometrics, which was in the 1970s, particularly in U.S. history, was a, a branch of U.S. history that tried to basically just add up information to, to come up with definitive answers. I'll talk about slavery, sort of like, like what was the role of um, what, what were the role of economic incentives versus, you know, uh, physical terror, these kinds of things. I mean, it, it wasn't about running huge models and predicting the future. Um, and cloud dynamic, cl cloudometrics was controversial enough. And so cloud dynamics is about like trying to model history and project forward. And so in this book, end times, Turchin argues that the key variable is elite overproduction. That when you have mass immiseration plus an elite overproduction, then you get social conflict because the presumably, you know, because that this inter elite conflict then can, you know, weaponize the, the misery of the masses and then you get civil wars and this sort of stuff. And he's he doesn't do a good job of defining elites. He doesn't do a good job of defining what a surplus elite elite is it's just i think it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo and i mean that's what, what he's I, right about is that that what he's right about is that there's tremendous inequality and that's mm -hmm. destabilized you know yeah exactly so charitable read of it is is kind of that okay he reaches not really surprising conclusions but in a, in a way he 
in in his in his attempt to be objective, he kind of leaves out a lot of depth that other people will bring in and has to generalize definition and things like that. If yeah. I if I just may be really frank though, I, I just really enjoyed this article and I just <laughs> have to say this type of I despise them. And I don't know why they allow like natural scientists to write about this type of stuff. Just before uh, I'm gonna ask my question, but before that, if anybody's interested in climate's effect on politics, they should read your book, Tropical Ca- Cancer is pretty much very similar oh, think, themes. Yeah. So Tropic of chaos. chaos. So Though I would say, yeah, yeah I, I have one regret about that uh, these days, which is I think I'm a little too kind to climate modeling hmm. in that book. And that in I that also, uh, rely, I mean, I have a line there where I say like, you know, they're not perfect, but they've been more wrong than they've been right. In, um, and that's true. They're not perfect. And I, I guess they've been more wrong. They've been more right than they've been wrong. Um, that's what I meant to say if I mess it up. But they've also been wrong in pretty significant ways. And those are important to note. For example, one, uh, you know, we're coming up, we're days away from, I believe it's the 15th anniversary of the Hurricane Katrina. And I covered that for the nation. I arrived in New Orleans on the third day, just, you know, the 82nd Airborne was just arriving. And, you know, that, and, I, you know, I wrote a bunch of pieces about that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure in every one of them, I'd I worked in like, and there's gonna work. We know mm-hmm. there are gonna be more frequent and more severe hurricanes landing. You know, well, that turned out to be wrong, and I was saying that because that's what the climate scientists were saying, and the climate scientists were saying it with total certainty because that's what their models said. And now they realize, okay, our models were wrong, and they have a new explanation for why that hasn't happened, even though their assumptions were that. As the ocean water heats, there's more energy in it. There's going to be more hurricanes mm-hmm. that be more intense, right? And mm-hmm. you know, there, you know, there, there are. I mean, all those assumptions are correct, but for other reasons that have to do, they now say with the heating of the surface of the land, and then the you know wind pushing off the land and driving hurricanes that form back out to sea, in fact, fewer hurricanes are landing, right? So they're, you know, they were wrong about that. So that doesn't mean climate modeling is totally wrong. And no, I'm not saying in any way that climate change isn't real. You can just, we can just observe that, you know, you don't have to theorize. Oh, yeah. that. I mean, I, that you just measure that it, it is, it is real. It's happening. Right. So now the, not to make too big a deal of the models, but just that, that, that I think the, the problem that I don't that I was not aware of in that book is that I think that the scientism, the fetishization, the reification of science into a kind of secular theology, and say, well, the climate models show that the world is going to end in 13 years, that this has actually been debilitating for the left, for environmentalists, for 100%. climate act. And I, I I really I actually that's something I want to write about. It, yeah. Yeah. This kind of like living, living, the fact of the matter is we know that the situation is bad and it's getting worse. Okay. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's all sorts of weird variables. Okay? Yeah. And, but to foreclose the future is to foreclose on any kind of progressive politics. And I've only come to realize that in the wake of this COVID insanity. And it's like, I see these the, the nihilism of these young politically minded people, and it, I feel really bad about having inadvertently contributed to that with a glib, with a perhaps too glib sort of like, "Hey, let's not knock the climate models," you know. Which is like, I mean, I'm not saying the climate models are worthless; they're not at all worthless. They're like, they're what we have, but we can't be like, they're you know, the climate model gods. Don't defend, don't don't yeah. offend the climate. Let's do exactly what they say. It's like, because hmm. if you do that, you're gonna you're gonna start thinking that, like AOC, that you shouldn't have children. That yeah. there's no there's no future. Then who cares if AOC isn't gonna have kids? Why is she in Congress? <laughs> you know? what's yeah. the no? And I mean, yeah. at least the climate scientists they put out like five scenarios, which is like scenario like this is like this scenario five. Yeah. But I mean, you're right. I mean, I think it, although the public seems to forget stuff pretty quickly, I'm coming to think at some point people are going to be like, and a lot of people are like, okay, like 
10 years ago, you said it's going to be catastrophic. 20 years ago, I mean, you said it so many times that I'm not forgetting about it. And I mean, now what? I, I mean, I mean I, exactly. I don't recall what you're talking about, the fact that they said there's going to be more hurricanes. But I remember from my like very young childhood, there was always a doom and gloom. We have about like five years, guys, five years and we are done. And it was like, it can be that. Like, it, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's too much. But just, Wait, uh, I was... Mm, sorry, go ahead. I mean, there's you could, you could a counter argument is that like you know global capitalism with its tendency towards boom and bust and crisis and and regeneration through catastrophic warfare. I mean, it's it's the apocalypse has sort of been ongoing for 500 years. If you look in the right place, you can find the apocalypse. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I just had two questions about this uh, about this guy and. One of them was that uh, does he like when he talks about the elites? Does he reference at all the literature like like C. Wright Mill or anything? Like does he like pay lip service to the existing literature? And the second question was: Do you think there is a problem with the lack of uh, international or political economy in the British sense? Like nobody does that anymore. It seems the idea that sort of a macro international political economy. It feels like like they just want to do this, what scientism, modeling, whatever it's called. I think, yeah, there is a real shortage of that. The, you know, I'm trying to remember. I I would I thought the same thing about Mills. And uh, and because I forgot, I'm gonna look. Does he have Mills in he does not have Mills in the index? Jesus. I think he's not mentioned nope. Mills. He, yeah. It's like Wikipedia yeah, have, has in, Mills in the draft on it. In after the thing, I actually I had a point about that about how his version of elites was you know was a very akin to to Mills's power elite with his because so okay. which is, was, so okay. your comment brings up like Turchin's definition of elites, which is people who wield one of four kinds of power, which is coercive power, you know, violence, economic power, bureaucratic power, and the fourth ideological power, and that's where it gets kind of slippery because then. You know, in in ideological power, you you know you're not talking about influencers, you know, freelance you know, like a quarter of the population at some point. Huh? Yeah, and so that's where it, that's since and that's his key category, elites. And the whole thing is that there aren't enough you know seats. Uh, the the number of elite aspirants grows, but the number of posts for these elite aspirants doesn't grow commensurate. And it's like he doesn't make any attempt to prove that. He resorts to analogies about. Um, you know, musical chairs. He uses like fictionalized yeah. biographies. You know, he kind of he invents a a, a MAGA Trumpian guy. He invents a, a like a wall a oh, occupy yeah. Wall Street veteran who goes to law school. It's like I mean, it's like he uh, an immigrant couple. The the guy is like Eastern European tech titan. Uh, the the this white. Is like Latin, Latin American sh- and the liberal. It's like, you're like, what? What? This is like, this is nonsense. This is the shit they do in marketing. They create like a persona, a perfect customer, like a Latina that is bisexual and, yeah. you know, is rich also. So, yeah, it's, oh, wow. Okay. Crazy person, basically. Yeah. But yeah, and, that, so, all right. Yeah, that was it. And I mean, of course, and I think, I don't remember where this made it in. I think it, I don't know, it's a long piece, but, you know, I mean, I, of course, he would have if he'd gone and found a real Steve. Steve is the gun-loving MAGA working-class guy, <laughs> or real whatever. You know, it's always so much more interesting and weird when you when you find the person to go. Well, here's the yeah, the, the person who's the archetype, and it's like yeah, but except they're like an individual, and they're they're going to be weird and in history and people are like that. So yeah, he and part of what's infuriating about this book is that he commits the the, the crime that Marxist historians and political economists were always accused of during the Cold War, which is being mechanistic. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is so mechanistic. There is no role for chance. He doesn't explain like personality, uh, you know, I'm just on and on these various, this, you know, the variables of geography and this, and that. You know, and that was always the thing that was said against Marxism. Oh, it's mechanistic. When in fact, it's not. I mean, there are mechanistic, believe me. Yes, there are mechanistic versions of Marxism. But, you know, classical Marxism is has many faults, but being mechanistic is not one of them. It's dialectic and, and pretty nuanced and generally quite empirical, particularly that kind of British 
historically minded political economy. He also um, really, he has no account of the of the rise of inequality. So the sort of main, the you know, thrust of his argument, the meat and potatoes of it is rising inequality in the United States. And he doesn't present any explanation for that. And there's a pretty good literature on that. That So I try to give a summary of what happens, right? And, you know, what happens in a nutshell is that you get the, you know, uh, the Great Depression, which it could be argued, and there's still debates about this, uh, but you, it could be argued that there's a crisis of overproduction plays some role in that. That leads to, you know, a crash, which leads to political polarization, a global crash, political polarization that leads to war that destroys all this means of production and resets the whole process of accumulation, right? That inadvertently takes care of the problem of overproduction. So then, you know, the U.S. goes into World War II, the New Deal, to deal with this crisis, empowers labor, creates a structure that will, in the future, allow for the Great Compression, as it's called, when American class inequality, you know, be decreases. You then have the the tremendous stimulus of World War II and the Reconstruction, because the war destroys enormous amounts of wealth that then has to be rebuilt. And so for a generation after the war, the U.S. in particular, but also other, you know, the other two key poles, of global capitalism at that time, Europe, Western Europe and Japan, can afford a kind of mass prosperity because back to the American situation, there was enough profits being, there, there was enough growth and enough profits being made that American corporations could afford to pay high taxes, pay high wages, submit to growing in, in levels of expensive regulation and still book healthy profits. And they were able to do that because this process of rebuilding took so long. By the mid 1960s, Japan and Germany have recovered. They have rebuilt their industrial base using the uh, the latest technologies. Their wages are lower, and they are no longer just working to supply their own markets, but they're beginning their export uh, offensives. And by the mid late 60s, you begin to get signs of glut, signs of overproduction. And in the United States, once rare luxuries like a full-sized refrigerator and a color television you know by the late 60s early 70s even poor people can have these right and it's like so the demand uh the post-war demand starts to to slow down and you get classic crisis of overproduction capital big business tries to push back and scrape back a larger share of the output from workers to restore profits. And I should say that average after-tax profit rates dropped by about two-thirds between 1966 and 1973. Mm -hmm. And the, that trend line, you have to imagine what that was like for the ruling class, right? I mean, the story is that it then, you know, bottoms out and then recovers under Reagan. But, you know, I mean, while you're on the way down, these guys are getting scared. Like, where does this go? So, yeah, big business is attempting to claw back money, wealth from workers i to to cut their wages get them to work harder for less and they can't because people are too radicalized organized labor is too strong 1974 sees more work stoppages than any year in the u.s since 1953 right there's this massive labor offensive in the u.s and the 1970s are such an interesting decade in the u.s in part because there's this class deadlock and you know the working class cannot be brought to heel and broken. And that expresses itself to some extent in a wage price spiral. Business raises consumer prices, but then labor unions are able to you know, compensate with increased wages. And you also then have stagflation. You have stagnant growth, yet rising prices. And this is finally addressed in the second two years of the Carter administration when Carter appoints Paul Volcker is chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he promises to beat inflation by plunging the economy into a recession. So uh, and interest rates were about, I think they were around like 9% in the late 70s when Volcker comes in around 79. 
and he by by 81 he has raised them or in that yeah by 81 he's raised them to to over just over 20 percent three times the the federal funds rate this has the effect of plunging the u.s economy which was then the largest economy in the world into the worst recession since the great depression at the same time carter loses the election Reagan comes in, he fires the air traffic controllers union, which was the only union that endorsed him. 11,000 of them go around, I think it's 13,000 of them go out on strike. He declares a strike illegal. A lot of them, because uh, there hadn't been massive privatization yet, a lot of them were direct federal employees. And he can also, you know, use federal law to to control even some of the private workers. He fires 11,000 of them. He arrests, the head of the union is arrested. So it smashes that strike. And this is a message to organized labor that the gloves are coming off. Stacks the National Labor Relations Board with people who are totally hostile to labor, cuts taxes on the rich, begins massive deregulation, uh, cuts massive cuts to public spending on health and human services, education, housing, all this sort of stuff increases military spending and all this has the effect of bringing down the share that goes to wages and the working class and increasing the share of output that goes to profits and thus restoring profits for the ruling class and it unleashes a wave of hype of turbo financialization financialization in turn leads to deindustrialization as firms merge and rationalize that means they get rid of they liquidate and you know inefficient units and they export to low wage areas from the unionized northeast to the non union us southeast and then offshore right so there's deindustrialization and you know and that is the beginning of reaganomics of what we now call neoliberalism and that is that's the story in a nutshell of why class inequality in the us then just like begins to you know yawn open again with um you know that kind of solid middle class that had been developed by the new deal and through the post war boom a portion of them rise up into the ranks of the nouveau riche a small portion and many of them fall down into destitution. And then those who remain in that middle class, the professional managerial class in particular, become, I argue in the piece, leaning on Barbara Ehrenreich, they actually become quite conservative in many ways, uh, including the liberals who read the New York Times. Those, those are the PMC people who were basically supporting really draconian, I would mm -hmm. say, ultra authoritarian policies around COVID, right? And so... Churchin is saying, well, there's, there, you know, there, there's not enough chairs in the game for the elite aspirants. And so these elites are going to lead a revolution. I mean, maybe, but the, first of all, they're not even elites. Mm -hmm. Who he's really talking about, are you talking about these downwardly mobile professional managerial class folks, right? Mm -hmm. They are, in terms of strict Marxist, classical Marxist political economy, they're workers. They sell their labor to survive. They don't own the means of production. In that way, they're unlike the old petty bourgeoisie. They don't own a little store. They're not a sole proprietor, accountant, or lawyer. They work for some big firm. And if that firm fires them, that's it. They have no ownership claim over that firm, right? They do. And as, as that class becomes more precarious, Ehrenreich argues, they actually become, they, they identify increasingly with elites. And they become increasingly concerned about falling. And I think she's right. I think that class is, is if anything, has become more reactionary than ever. Um, and we're now at a point where we see a right wing and a left wing version of that. You know, the, the right wing version of the precarious professional managerial class are freaked out about immigrants and are freaked out about poor people of color. And they've got those old kind of right wing law and order politics. Right? And they're the people who'd like eat up the stories about mass shoplifting and chaos and all sorts of stuff. And on the left, the cultural left, those same people are totally obsessed with deplorables and how the interior of the country, particularly the U.S. South, is like a no go area full of violent, dangerous rednecks, which is like wrong, you know, um, so, so, 
say in that article. But yeah, I mean, the Turchin book is is wrong. Now there could be instability in the future. There may be, but I I end the, the review bringing in a variable that Turchin doesn't theorize at all, which is the state. Mm -hmm. Do you think if you write a book about revolution and state failure, you should talk about the state? You should, you know, you should think about what this institution is, right? And the U.S. state, I argue, having studied in my entire adult life, I mean, that's the through line in all the books I've written, is state power. The U.S. state is incredibly powerful right now. It has, I mean, I, th I think it has qualitatively more and different kinds of power than it had even in 1980. I mean, that, you know, from the, the number of SWAT teams everywhere mm. to the kind of surveillance, the kind of the new sort of censorship that's developed that we've seen only coming out of COVID, with collaboration with the tech companies. I mean, this is a very, very powerful entity and a credible attempt to predict the future would, I think, have to deal with that variable. So, I mean, if Trump is jailed and if there is you know, more and more undeniable evidence, if the mainstream of, of Biden's, you know, corruption, if the mainstream feels like, wow, our brands are really going to suffer if we don't admit that there are some facts here. And they have to then sort of, you know, acknowledge this story. And there's credible questions like, you know, the head of Burmissa, well, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting myself here, but here's an example. <laughs> something, right? I mean, there there is a, an FBI document, this form, um, I think it's called the F, FM 1023. 1023 is the number, I forget what the numbers are, the, the letters in the beginning of this. This 1023 form from a confidential human source that the FBI describes as reliable that they've been working with for 10 years. This guy is an American businessman in Ukraine, and he reports to the FBI on conversations he's had with the head of Vermissa. And the head of Vermissa is complaining to this guy about the bribes that he's paid not only to Hunter Biden, but to Joe Biden. He claims that he paid $5 million to Hunter and $5 million to Joe Biden. No, that's not proof. That's just somebody saying this. But it's weird that the FBI withheld this and refused to release it. Somehow, Senator Chuck Grassley, a Republican, got it from them and released a basically unredacted version of it. So if stuff like that comes out while Trump is actually in jail, there could, there could maybe there could be some crazy stuff happen. But call me cynical, I think that the national security state, the FBI, uh, the ATF, these agencies are more than a match for any kind of you know, turmoil that any kind of violent upheaval that would happen. So, I mean, I, I think the real risk is a deepening of, of a kind of, you know, authoritarianism of the center, that that's, that's one of the real risks we face um, due to growing immiseration plus, you know, political corruption, not like this whole elite aspirants and there's not enough games, mm -hmm. not enough chairs from the musical chair game. I mean, that <laughs> yeah, I can't believe musical chairs were involved. Apparently he gave a metaphor analogy using that. Apparently. Yeah, it was... <laughs> and I mean, this, I... Is, this is an idea that comes from, sorry, but, but I mean, you know, theorists of and historians of third world revolution have noted this um, in the past. I mean, Olivier Roy, <laughs> uh, you know, a theorist of political Islam was, use this to some extent. And and there are examples, and I give Turchin credit for that, for being correct about, you know, like Egypt, you know, there are examples in, in some cases in the global South where you can say there, there really is this kind of overproduction of the professional class and they they do but then sometimes become revolutionary leaders. 